Dialogue with a Doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians. Welcome to Dialogue with a Doctor. My name is Dr. Gregory Leach, and uh, if you've been to the show before, welcome back. If you haven't, um, you're going to learn a lot tonight. Uh, this is a show, um, actually, we, I used to do it with my partner and, and friend, Jim York. He's now really producing the show, uh, so he's not really on the show anymore, so I get to do this by myself today. Um, we're here this evening, or this whatever time of day you watch this, with Dr. Raymond Phillips. He's a practicing gastroenterologist in Naples, Florida, and he's been here for quite some time. And we're going to talk about, um, among other things, recurrent C. difficile infection and multiple topics associated with that. Um, and um, we'll start off by asking uh, Dr. Phillips who he is and where he came from. All right, thanks so much for the introduction, Jim. I appreciate it, and I appreciate the opportunity to come back and, and speak uh, to you uh, on, a, uh, on this particular topic. Now, the, um, uh, first off, I just want to introduce myself. I'm a gastroenterologist, and I, uh, you know, what a gastroenterologist is is an individual uh, who's had a number of years of training. You know, I went to Princeton University, uh, University uh, and I uh, attended on an Army ROTC scholarship. I went to medical school in uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and then I did my internal medicine training at Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia, and then I was chief resident there. Then I came on active duty in the Army, uh, worked uh, two years as an internist at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and then I was selected to, to do additional training in gastroenterology at Walter Reed. Uh, I did that training over a two-year period, and then I was on staff at Walter Reed for two years, and was principally doing research, and I was an assistant professor of medicine. Uh, after I got out of the Army, I came down to Naples, established our practice here in, in the early 90s, and uh, over the years, our practice has grown, and uh, I work currently with Dr. Laburski and Dr. Michael Marks, uh, Dr. Gustavo Rivera, and we have additional physicians that are joining us. But our principal office is in Naples, and uh, we have additional offices in, in Bonita, and, um, as well as Marco Island. Uh, but over the years since we've arrived, as I said, a practice has grown. We're doing a number of, of different uh, uh, enterprises to include our clinical practice, uh, as well as research, uh, which is a big part of our, our practice. Uh, and. Uh, Increasingly, uh, over the years, you know, we've been trying to emphasize page, patient education, uh, and this is a great forum to be able to provide an in-depth discussion of medical topics that we're really, frankly, not able to discuss in detail given the, the press of time in the course of a regular uh, day and, and seeing patients. And it gives us an opportunity to really discuss in great detail particular uh, issues and new concepts that are emerging in, in my specialty. So doing research or participating in research is, sounded like it's not new for you because you did that um, back in uh, Jefferson or? Well, I did that at Jefferson Hospital and, and uh, again in Philadelphia. Did that at Walter Reed as mm -hmm. well in particular. That was a requirement uh, and, uh, and I enjoyed it. And it gives you a, sort of an introduction to emerging concepts and new medications and, uh, and we've continued to embrace that here. And in, this, in, the con, in the context of doing research in the practice, you know, we're, we're not talking uh, uh, about experimental drugs. We're talking about medications that are underdeveloped by pharmaceutical companies and uh, looking to, to add new indications, uh, med typically phase three trials, phase four trials that have been shown to be safe, but now in an effort to be shown to be effective. And in one of these particular trials that we're participating in is a one uh, for treating this condition uh, called recurrent cl uh, Clostridia difficile. Um, and it's, it's, it's rising, it's uh, emerging epidemic in the last 15 years and causes uh, about 25,000 deaths in the United States per year. I think, I think some of our viewers may have heard of C. difficile, some I'm, I'm sure haven't. It, it, what is that exactly? Well, uh, we, we refer to it, the, the actual former term is Clostridia difficile, but it's a little hard to say that all the time, so we abbreviate that and say C. diff or C. difficile. The difficile just refers to as extraordinarily difficult to culture this in the original um, uh, microbiological efforts to identify this. Uh, but it is a, a germ, uh, it is a bacteria, it, it's a pathogen, it causes uh, diarrhea, 
and it can cause persistent diarrhea. And it, it's an emerging issue as a result of success in medicine, success being equated with the use and the prevalence use of, of antibiotics across the United States in particular. Uh, what has occurred is that what was originally identified as a nuisance diarrhea infection uh, has now been linked to the use of antibiotics in individuals and typically an individual will receive a course of antibiotics for uh, you know, a clear-cut indication, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, and then subsequently, a few weeks later, a month or two later, they'll have intractable diarrhea and it'll be mm. identified as a result of this infection. And what, has, what we've learned is that this infection uh, can only emerge as a result of a compromise of the defenses of your body. And, uh, and in this particular circumstance, uh, the defense are, are the normal bacteria within your colon. Now, this is, this is an emerging concept uh, that really has been quite exciting. And the bacteria that are present within your colon uh, are collectively called the microbiome. And uh, because it's a, an ecosystem uh, that uh, exists within your colon that develops shortly after birth, it's an ecosystem of collection of different bacteria. Uh, right now, it's been estimated there's about a thousand different species uh, that are present, and typically they come from your mother and your father. And, in, and they, in turn, uh, develop their microbiome from their mother and father before them, principally from the mother. But this microbiome, what it does, it's a collection of bacteria that forms an ecosystem within your colon and provides a number of beneficial and therapeutic uh, 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 benefits to the host. So you said that this growth of the microbiome in, in the infant, it takes up to two years to become mature? That's correct. And, and the, uh, the, when, when a child is born, uh, the, the GI tract is completely sterile. There are no bacteria within the gastrointestinal system because typically the child in, in, in the womb is, is swallowing amniotic fluid and, and that's sterile. However, as soon as delivery occurs, you know, either be it vaginal, uh, and that's the, that's the quickest way to, to receive inoculation. If it's a cesarean section, well, it occurs more gradually over the course of the next week or so as the, as the child bonds with the mother. But the, the notion is, is an inoculum of bacteria, the child swallows it, those bacteria begin, and, and that inoculum uh, typically it comes from the mother uh, in the vaginal area, and, they, and you get these bacteria that establish themselves within the colon, and they establish an ecosystem uh, uh, that's very, very biodiverse, and it has benefits to the host. Benefits in terms of production of certain vitamins, like vitamin K that helps with clotting. Benefits in terms of providing an additional nutritional source. Your colon is responsible for about 15% uh, of your uh, caloric intake. Uh, from the foods that you eat, through, principally through fermentation of indigestible material and through that fermentation product, process and the production of small or short chain fatty acids, which are a form of, of um, nutrition, your body, your colon in particular, can extract that nutrition and you can derive additional calories. What has not been realized until recently is collectively the microbiome actually provides defenses against other pathogens that might uh, your GI tract might encounter. And your microbiome uh, actively secretes different types of antimicrobial substances that help protect you and protect the microbiome. Uh, so it's a synergistic, it's a symbiotic relationship to the extent that these bacteria uh, well, they take advantage of a nice little home, but they provide you all these different benefits. And so it's a useful uh, combination, uh, and it's a useful partnership, if you will. Now, the difficulty is when you, as I mentioned before, if you take antibiotics for, for a well-intentioned purpose, say, for example, pneumonia or urinary tract infection, that, those antibiotics uh, will, will, of course, attack the infection of interest, but will also deplete the normal bacteria within your colon. And in some individuals, those bacteria uh, cannot be reconstituted in a prompt fashion. So for a time, this microbiome is, is um, weakened, if you will. And if you come in contact with this other germ, this Clostridia difficile we're talking about, 
uh, it, it can establish an infection within your colon and release toxins that can cause uh, inflammation and release of fluid and diarrhea as a consequence. And so uh, it hadn't really been recognized uh, until the, 19, uh, in the, the 1950s and 60s, but in the 1980s and 90s, it was increasingly clear that this is a widespread infection across the United States. And then in Montreal in the, in the 19, early 2000s, a new version of this infection emerged uh, that was a particularly hypervirulent in, in terms of production of toxins and could kill people very, very rapidly. Uh, and so not only was it before a nuisance infection in terms of causing persistent diarrhea, but now I had the prospect of actually uh, being very, very lethal in certain circumstances. Now, the, the, fortunately, we have means of treating this infection, treating it to the extent of using another antibiotic <laughs> to, uh, to, to kill off the C. difficile. Uh, and, uh, and generally, we patted ourselves on the back and said, oh, gee, that's grand. We've treated it. We're so smart. We've used another antibody to kill this. Uh, and and, and the majority of circumstances, we were successful. But this germ uh, is very sophisticated. It developed a means of being able to survive the onslaught of an antibiotic uh, course. And the way it survives is it's capable of producing spores uh, while it's active, and those spores, if you can, it's analogous to microscopic eggs, they, um, they linger within the GI tract, but they also contaminate the environment in which you live. And those spores are basically indestructible, and, and they'll live in the dust, they'll live on the surfaces of a home, and, and then uh, if a person re-ingest those spores a week later or two weeks later or three weeks later after getting rid of the original infection, they can become reinfected. And so it, it creates a circumstance where an individual can have the infection eliminated, but then they can become reinfected. And the reason they become reinfected is the microbiome has not been able to reconstitute itself to provide a defense uh, for, for your body. Uh, so it can, uh, it can, you can have a circumstance where an individual can have repeated infections uh, because of this, uh, the, this depleted microbiome. How, how long would it normally take for the microbiome to get back to normal? And those are studies that have just recently been done. This is just an emerging field, and, and I'm describing to you in the past several years. But uh, detailed studies looking after a course of Cipro or Levofloxacin, uh, Leviquin or Ciprofloxacin, those are some of the favorites that are being used and most highly associated with hmm. C. diff. Uh, after you take a course of Cipro or a course of uh, 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 Leviquin, it takes three to six months for your microbiome to replenish itself. Uh, and in some individuals, it never quite gets back to the way it was before you receive the antibiotic. Uh, so there's a profound effect on, on the uh, microbiome uh, before it can uh, sort of reestablish its, its normal integrity. But during that time, uh, when it's depleted, uh, an individual can be susceptible to, to recurrences of the C. diff. And that's what we're discovering now is that when, we've, when we looked at studies with regard to C. difficile, uh, there's a 25% recurrence rate after the first infection. Uh, and if you had a first recurrence uh, and then you treat that recurrence, there's a 50 or 60% chance you'll get a second recurrence. And if you get a second recurrence, it's almost an 80 to 90% of chance you'll get a third recurrence. So I've had patients who had six to eight episodes or 10 or 12 episodes of recurrences and each one is fairly profound in its effect uh, in terms of making a person feel very, very weak uh, and, uh, and depleted as a result of a diarrheal infection. Now, naturally, this seems to affect the individuals who are, who are most um, sort of immunologically suppressed, older individuals, people who have multiple comorbidities, but remarkably, it will affect very young individuals, young adults. Uh, and can be uh, quite, a, quite a challenge to deal with. Now, that's the way things have, been st have stood now for a number of years over these past 10 years. Uh, but as a result of realizing the effect on the microbiome, in the last five years, 
there's, there's been this growing um, uh, realization that uh, for those individuals who have had recurrences, multiple recurrences of C. difficile, that we can reestablish a normal microbiome and these individuals can be uh, cured of their recurrence tendency. Um, and I can tell you more how you reestablish a normal microbiome in just a little bit here. Well, that, that's perfect timing because we're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and talk more about recurrent C. difficile and stool transplants. Oh, you've got it there. <laughs> that's how we replenish right. a normal we'll be back microbiome. In a <laughs> Thinking of buying or selling a home in Naples, Marco, Bonita, or Estero, Florida? Think of the most experienced York Real Estate Group associated with the number one brokerage in Naples, Downing Fry Realty, which produced $1.9 billion in sales in 2014, controlling 43% of all transactions in Naples. Jim, Michael, and Morgan York make up the York Real Estate Group of Downing Fry Realty. With over 250 million in sales transactions, they can offer you the expertise and trust you want and need in a Realtor. Call them today at 239-273-6727 or visit their website, www.NaplesYorkRealEstate.com. Welcome back. <clears throat> Pardon me. Welcome back to Dialogue with the Doctor. I'm Dr. Gregory Leach, and uh, we've been talking with Dr. Raymond Phillips, Ray Phillips, a practicing gastroenterologist, special subspecialist, so to speak, in, in Naples, Florida. Um, we're talking about recurrent C. difficile, which is uh, a bacterial infection. It's an opportunistic bacterial infection that infects our gut. Um, and we got down to talking about how to perhaps finally get rid of it in the, in the patients that have had it, the, the patients that get it more than several times. Yeah, I exactly. And just a um uh, as, we, uh, as we were discussing a moment ago, when you have uh, uh, Clostridia difficile, you can get multiple recurrences, and those multiple recurrences uh, develop as a result of the, um, of the microbiome, the bacteria within your colon, uh, being so depleted, they can't uh, repel, they can't defeat this, this uh, particular germ. And so, uh, in the last five years, it's been realized that if we can replenish the microbiome, we can actually uh, be able to prevent multiple recurrences of this infection. Now, initially, uh, there was efforts looking at different uh, probiotics in an effort to reestablish the, the normal microbiome. But, you know, it's, it's very akin to, I, I guess the best analogy I've come across is if there's a forest fire and the whole forest on a hillside is depleted and there's nothing left but charred timber and a, and a, and a few weeks later a few blades of grass come up. That's typically what you would uh, view as what's happening within your colon. The biodiversity, all the birds and the animals and the trees and all the uh, plant life has been wiped out and there's very, very few bacteria left over in terms of diversity and it's not a diverse enough community to defend the host any longer. So you really need to reestablish uh, a normal uh, ecosystem, and the quickest way to do that is through a stool transplantation. And, they, uh, and that has uh, created great excitement uh, in the last uh, five, uh, five years. Well, when I, when I tell my patients about stool transplants for, in teaching them about the microbiome of the gut, everybody has this reaction like, what do you mean by that? How can you do that? That, that sounds unbelievable. Well, it is pretty astonishing. Uh, and uh, there's multiple ways to do this in terms of reestablishing a, uh, uh, you know, a normal microbiome. Uh, I think the most direct way is, is through a, um, uh, the, the means through which we do this is by doing a colonoscopy and delivering uh, the transplant directly into the colon. Uh, uh, that's the most direct way that we've found and seems to be most effective because we're able to deliver the transplant in the portion of the colon where there's the highest concentration of bacteria and it's most likely to be able to establish itself. In Europe, they have a preference for, for infusing this stool transplant through a nasogastric tube, through a tube placed through the nose into the stomach. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, so there seems to be a little dichotomy in Europe versus the United States in terms of preference of how, how we approach this. But, but regardless of that, the, uh, the success is, is much the same, although it's a little higher with a colonoscopy in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 
providing the stool transplant. Now, the donor is particularly important. You, you cannot just pick anybody off the street. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can't pick off anybody off the street because you want to take a donor who's particularly healthy, does not have any gastrointestinal illnesses, does not have any illnesses at all or infectious illnesses that might be transmitted. So they have to be carefully screened to be certain they don't have any infectious illnesses. But this is, this is an exciting thing. We'll talk about this in future talks. Uh, what we're learning, though, increasingly is the microbiome may be the mechanism by which other illnesses occur. For example, it might be the basis for Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, coronary artery disease, metabolic syndrome that can lead to obesity. So there's a number of different areas that the microbiome can influence. It can actually make people obese. It can give coronary artery disease, potentially. It can potentially cause ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So you don't want to be willy-nilly transmitting uh, or, or putting people at risk by giving a stool transplantation uh, from someone who might be at risk for those things. So you, I think you said to me when we talked about this once before that the, the microbiome of the gut is responsible for how much of the metabolic activity in the body? At least 15%. It provides at least 15% of the calories to the rest of your body. Okay. And, um, uh, and, and, and a certain a number of different uh, vitamins like we talked about. Uh, but what we're learning is that it can have these profound effects in terms of actually influencing other areas so that it might be the mechanism by which other illnesses occur, obesity, uh, issues in terms of coronary disease and so forth I just mentioned. And so the Food and Drug Administration in 2013 um, the, uh, of course, an instrument of the government, uh, uh, sort of passed this edict that stool was a drug, and they were going to regulate stool as a drug. Uh, and as a result, uh, people couldn't be willy-nilly going out there and giving each other transplantations. You'd have to actually do studies in terms of uh, scientific studies to really show that it's effective. Now. The trouble with doing those kind of studies is they're long and tedious and take years to complete. And in the issue of C. difficile, where you have 25,000 people dying of C. difficile infection in the United States alone, and many, many people uh, being uh, severely impacted by recurrent C. difficile infection, uh, there was quite a pushback by the, from the gastroenter uh, gastroenterologists across the United States, and the Food and Drug Administration relented on the issue of transplantation for recurrent C. difficile to say that in this context, you, know, you don't, we, they will not wait for formal studies to be done, but as long as an individual realizes that it's an experimental procedure, the recipient realizes it's an experimental procedure, and that, um, uh, and that as long as the donor has been properly screened uh, and that the donor is known by the, uh, by the physician, then, then you can proceed with uh, using this emerging uh, therapeutic uh, technology uh, for treating people with a current C. diff. Now, naturally, you know, there, there, uh, there's been some efforts to innovate at, in terms of providing an easier way to give a stool transplantation, and, and uh, such things as uh, um, uh, condensing the stool transplant into a capsule uh, has been explored. Uh, but an effort by pharmaceutical companies to standardize a microbiome and place it in a capsule and replenish an individual's microbiome uh, through, a, uh, through an oral capsule has, has, cap has been an area of intense research. And we're actually doing one of those studies now. We're recruiting individuals who have had recurrent C. difficile uh, and for enrollment in that study where we'd actually give them uh, this oral capsule as a way of replenishing the microbiome. So we're excited about this. We just began the study in the last two months, and it, it was only, the study was only begun three months ago. Uh, so we don't have any results yet to... to uh, so how many, how many strains are, of bacteria are in this capsule? Well, the, um, in a normal microbiome, there's a thousand different species of bacteria. Mm -hmm. Within this capsule, there's the spores from 40 different species. So what they have done is identified the bacteria that are believed to be most important for defending uh, you to establishing a viable microbiome. 
and then in turn have uh, placed those spores in a capsule that can be taken. The capsule, of course, traverses the GI tract, is released, and those spores then reestablish uh, a new home, if you will, <laughs> in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the colon. And so it seems it has shown effectiveness in phase two trials, and now we're doing a phase three study. So we're very, very excited about that. And um, uh, some people have jokingly called this repopulation Repo of, the, of, the, of the GI tract. That but but the... Uh, that's exactly what it is. Yes. Let me ask you just a sim simple question some of my patients ask me about. You know, excessive use of hand washing agents, um, you know, alcohol agents that people use all the time in grocery stores or at home. In, 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 in your home, when you're raising children, would that interfere with the you know, population of the microbiome in, in the first two years? Because the, these infants are supposed to be getting bacteria. Well, actually, uh, that is a good point. And what we're learning now is that on each area of your body, the front, the, your palm versus the back of your hand, mm -hmm. Uh, your back versus your abdomen, there are different sets of bacteria that like that portion of your body. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, if you will, a little bit of microbiome depending on which portion of your body. And those bacteria seem to have a beneficial effect as well. And so the excessive hand washing using antibacterial soap may actually have an adverse effect by completely eliminating these bacteria. Uh, it may have an unwanted effect. And so, uh, and that's an emerging area, much, much less is known about that at this point. Uh, but we do know, you know, on the issue of recurrence Clostridia difficile, that we've had great success with this dual transplantation. It's about 90, 95% effective as far as preventing recurrences of that infection. And so we've been very, very excited about that. And, uh, and for those individuals who have had this, you know, at Naples Community Hospital, we established that program last year. You know, we've had uh, 18 individuals who've undergone uh, that stool transplantation, you know, with a 90% success rate. And the individuals who fail, well, they've undergone re, uh, they're in the process of undergoing a retransplantation at this time, and one in individual was lost to follow up and moved out of the area, so to speak. So it, it's been a great success in our hands, and it's exciting in that we're able to duplicate the results that other individuals have found. So it's not a, a, a circumstance where, uh, where it's just a, a, a dumb luck, so to speak. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate you coming onto the show. And once again, I've learned even more than I learned before about this subject. And um, we enjoyed having your company. Um, and we welcome to you back to other shows at Dialogue with the Doctor. Well, thanks because, so much, Greg. I appreciate it. Because there's it. more yeah. to learn. Oh, there's certainly more to learn. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs>